Hello everyone, and welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Shrikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. Um, as you can see, we are again in front of our very, very motivating background image, uh, which is of a rover on Mars. And uh, we are, as of now, almost um, at the stage where we are stating uh, all these very, very interesting results on uh, analyzing such uh, autonomous algorithms, right? So what we have been doing is uh, we have been looking at the Lyapunov stability theorems, all right? So, uh, so this is essentially, as I had stated, are the most seminal results, all right? of uh, nonlinear control all right so uh, what we have looked at are uh, you know four of these theorems like the first four so in each of these cases we uh, start with a c1 function which is also positive uh, which is also positive definite and therefore these two criteria together are uh, stated to make v a candidate Lyapunov function, all right? Uh, and if we do have a candidate Lyapunov function, then uh, we evaluate the derivative of the function along the dynamical system. And based on that, we make some conclusions. So first we saw that if it's semi-definite only, that is the least possible property on the derivative, then the equilibrium zero is stable. If it's semi -def if the derivative is semi-definite and V itself is decrescent, then the equilibrium is uniformly stable. Then in the previous lecture, we saw the two stronger properties. Like I said, the definitions move to stronger and stronger versions as we go down below here. Right. So, uh, so if you look at the next property, this is essentially uh, when v dot is in fact negative definite, then we have local asymptotic stability of the equilibrium denoted as AS. And on top of that, if v is decrescent, we get local uniform asymptotic stability denoted as UAS. So where we were last time is uh, we were working out this example for asymptotic stability and we had not completed this example. So, of course, we want to complete this example today. In any case, what I will do is I will mark the beginning of today's lecture uh, here so that yeah, I will mark the beginning here, right? So, I know that uh, this is where I have to begin, like the new definitions. But before we go forward to right here, we are going to complete our discussion on this example. If you notice, um, this is a linear system, but the exam, but since we are doing a Lyapunov analysis, so this may look a little bit more complicated to you than you know a typical linear system, right? Which uh, you know, which may not be something that you like, but well, that's what it is. Okay. Uh, so, so if you look at this system, right, if you look at this system, what you have is um, something like, uh, you know, a typical uh, spring was damper, which is normalized, right? And so here we um, take our candidate Lyapunov function as a uh, sort of a linear combination of the x1, x2 states and the x1 state. Okay, so we take a quadratic in x1 and x2, a sum of x1, x2, and an x1 squared. Uh, what I do additionally from the previous time is I introduce these uh, additional sort of uh, tweaks that I can potentially play with. This is what was missing last time. So these tweaks are this k in front of this x1 here, and this <coughs> 2 alpha in the bottom here. Okay, In fact, I think there was a 2 already. I'm just adding the alpha here. All right. So now, um, of course, 
I, I, if you look at if you want to check the positive definiteness etc etc it's not too difficult you can see that this is zero only when both x1 and x2 are zero yeah and it is again something that we sort of discussed a little bit last time right? so and if x1 and x2 are non-zero or uh, the state x which is equal to x1 x2 is non-zero then of course you have a uh, strictly positive outcome from this function okay if any one of them is non-zero you can see you will have a strictly positive outcome okay um so so this is um you know sort of uh, nice all right so this is sort of nice uh so so let's not worry about the positive definiteness anymore so we already have a c1 candidate uh, c1 function which is positive definite therefore v is a candidate lyapunov function right now if i take the derivative carefully with the k and alpha now being present yeah then i get kx1 plus x2 times kx1 dot plus x2 dot and from here i get 1 over alpha x1 x1 dot right? and then it's just substitution of the dynamics here right so this is where i substitute for the dynamics so kx1 dot is simply kx2 and x2 dot is just minus x1 minus x2 and x1 dot is x2 again here okay now uh, what i do is i try to sort of combine at least bit of this term here okay and in order to do that what i do is i uh, write this x2 as kx1 plus x2 minus kx1 okay so x2 is being broken into kx1 plus x2 minus kx1 right it's easy to see that this is still x2 right and because i do that this kx1 plus x2 term can be combined with this guy and because of the minus kx1 term i get a minus kx1 squared over alpha all right now what i what so this is already a good term so so i'm going to continue to sort of write this term everywhere so this is like minus x1 squared and i have k over alpha i'm just using the red color in order to distinguish between this these additional constants that i got uh, which was not there last time okay, so here also i continue to get uh, if i make this bigger i will continue to get minus x1 squared and then i will get a k over alpha okay so going back to this step here i just combine this term to, and then bring it here inside this term so if i take kx1 plus x2 common here you can see that i'm going to retain these terms kx2 minus x1 minus x2 which is this term and i'm going to add this x1 over alpha right here okay so very simple and then this term of course remain as it is all through so i don't even worry about this term now if i look at this term right here i combine the x1 and x2 terms okay? so i have this term in x1 and these two terms in x2 okay? so i get something like this simply by combining the x1 and x2 terms now what do i do i take 1 minus k the, the, the negative of 1 minus k common outside so i'm left with x1 times 1 minus alpha 1 minus 1 over alpha divided by 1 minus k plus x2 right now in order for this to be a negative square term which is what i want for negative definiteness i know that i want this to be a negative square term in fact i want it to look exactly like this so this term has to resemble this term okay in order for that to happen we have a few requirements the first is that uh, k has to be less than one right because otherwise this is not positive anymore the second is alpha has to be positive of course k also has to be positive i mean this is not negotiable anyway and right? k definitely has to be positive all the constants that we introduce have to be positive here all right so otherwise we land up in problems due to definiteness issues okay right so k has to be positive but it has to be less than one to make sure this is positive so that i get a negative outside 
which is what I want, because something like a negative square term. All right. I, I know that alpha has to be positive. Now, because I want this term to resemble this term, right? I want this guy to be exactly equal to k. That's what I have written here. And then I sort of expand this quadratic in k. 1 minus 1 over alpha is k minus k squared. And so I bring it all to one side and I get this quadratic equation, which has two solutions, of course. Right? I don't. I mean, I can pick either solution, right? I mean, in fact, I, I don't think we need to distinguish as such. Uh, let's see. So I'm not going to distinguish. I can pick either solution. Right? I can pick either solution. So note that uh, for there to exist a solution, I need this quantity to be positive, right? Because if this is negative, then this becomes imaginary. So K has no solution. Which is not okay. If k has no solution, then I don't have a Lyapunov candidate Lyapunov function. All right. So we definitely want k to be uh, no positive, right? We want k to uh, that uh, that k have a solution, right? That, that this quadratic equation have a solution. Therefore, I need whatever is inside this to be uh, positive. And for that, I have this requirement, right? That this is less than one. Right? And this gives, I mean, I can simply solve this very quickly, right? Not too difficult. I can solve this and I will get um, alpha is less than four by three. Right? I mean, I'm just simply taking one minus one over alpha is less than one over four, and I do a simplification and I just get alpha has to be less than four by three, right? So I already know that alpha has to be positive, and now I have that alpha is less than four by three. Right. So uh, now, actually, I was not completely correct. I already had mentioned that k has to be less than one. Therefore, I cannot choose the plus sign here, because if I choose the plus sign here, I may end up with k more than one. Okay. But in any case, either one is possible because there is a division by two here. Yeah, either one is possible. You just have to think carefully about making sure that k remains less than one. Okay, that is all. Either case is possible. So I have two conditions now. I have that k is between zero and one, and now I have that alpha is uh, right. Uh, you would have thought this would work. I apologize, just give me a second. All right, in any case, it's okay. All right, this, and I have this condition, right? Alpha has to be between zero and four by three. Okay, and I also have K has to be between zero and one. Okay, so these are important things. Now, so so what I can do is, you know, one possible choice, just in case you're wondering what it should be. One possible choice is say I make four, one minus one over alpha to be exactly equal to half. Okay, instead of taking it as, because it has to be less than one. So I just take it as equal to half. And from this, I can calculate alpha to be eight over seven. It's not difficult to see that this is, you know, this is going to be less than this. Eight by seven is less than four by three. Okay. So simple. So what have I achieved? I have achieved by making these choices of alpha and appropriate k. What I've achieved is something like, I mean, let me complete this. Right? This is like uh, minus 1 minus k, k x1 plus x2 whole square minus k over alpha x1 squared, which is in fact negative definite, right? which is in fact negative definite. And using the Lyapunov theorem now, right, that uh, v dot is negative definite, I can conclude local asymptotic stability. In fact, v is also decrescent in this case, right? If you notice, there is no uh, 
no i'm sorry where was i yeah there is no time dependence in v at all right so obviously it's decrescent right? decrescence is free all in decrescence is free right so therefore v is also decrescent right so in fact not only can i apply this result i can in fact apply in fact apply this result also right that v dot is negative definite and v is decrescent okay and this essentially gives me local uniform asymptotic stability right so this is going to be uh, i'm going to characterize this as uniformly asymptotically stable right uniformly asymptotically stable all right let's let's continue then with the uh, rest of the definitions right so now uh, once we have the local result we also want to look at the global result what do we need for the global result right uh, what we require is that again you keep adding more and more qualifiers right so what we require is the first two are of course first two are the same v dot has to be negative definite v has to be decrescent and v also has to be radially unbounded okay so in this case if you notice v cannot be a map like this anymore right so uh, in this case in fact i have to carefully specify require v to be mapping t0 infinity cross rn to r okay in this case the appropriate candidate lyapunov function has to map the entire state space because if you remember radial unboundedness requires v to dominate a class kr function which is by nature a function which uh, that's that's increasing for all values of the state and goes to infinity right so this this for radial unboundedness of v you require this lower bound to happen for all values of the state right and since this has to be the case v itself has to be defined first for all values of the state right so no more ball of radius r right so we need v to map all time and all states to a real number okay great see other than that it looks very identical to this just with this additional radial unbounded property right and then i have global uniform asymptotic stability now if i again go back to my example in fact a very very nice example right which which helps me actually cover all my definitions to be honest yeah and, and that's why it's a you know really really simple nice little example okay as simple as that it's not uh something too magical but it's it's, it's a rather simple example okay so if you look at this um uh, like a global uh, stability kind of example if you look at this v function itself right you already see that v is not just positive definite definite it is in fact also radially unbounded so this is positive definite but in fact also radially unbounded why is it radially unbounded it's evident that it's positive definite and as the states go to infinity v has to go to infinity right you can take any direction of the state it doesn't matter right? even if you move along the line kx1 plus x2 equal to 0 towards infinity that is the only sort of issue that can happen that is this term remains zero even for large values of state it is true this term does remain zero for large values of state if i move along kx1 plus x2 equal to 0 right along the straight line kx1 plus x2 equal to 0 this uh, in fact sorry if k is positive then this is like a straight line in the opposite side direction along that straight line if i go to infinity this term is zero however this term goes to infinity so there is no way of avoiding going to infinity as the states go to infinity for this problem okay so therefore this is radially unbounded also so in fact 
and all the other proof remains exactly the same. In fact, so this system is not just US, it is in fact globally uniformly asymptotically stable. Okay. Now one might then wonder, I mean, are there I mean examples which are <laughs> right, are there examples which are after, I mean sort of uh, not global? Right? Yes. Of course, I mean, as soon as I as soon as I start to get, um, you know, uh, non-linear things happening, there's a possibility for a lot of different kind of phenomena. Okay, so if I look at, uh, say, let me try. I'm going to give this a shot. This is example five. If I look at this system, x1 dot is x2, and x2 dot is say. Um, minus sign x1 minus x2. I want to make this a little bit simpler for us, so I'm going to use something like this. Yeah, so just for simplicity of analysis. I'm going to use this. So if I now look at this system, right? What can I say? Yeah, what can I say? So, so here in this case, I choose my v x one x two as one minus cosine x one. Um, let's see if this is going to help me. Hmm. But this might create some trouble for me. Guys, mm -hmm. this is going to be. Yeah, so say I look at something like this, a system of this kind. Yeah, this is uh, uh, maybe an interesting looking, odd looking construction, but yeah, let's not worry about that. So if I, I'm just trying to illustrate a case when, you know, this is sort of constructed, but I'm still trying to illustrate a way, case where uh, you don't get global properties. So if I take this one minus cosine x1 uh, plus half x2 squared, this is positive definite. Right? Um, why? I think I'm not sure, but I think we had considered this example in one of our lectures. Uh, for non-zero x1, so so um, x1 um, is um, you know if you look at the range of x1, when x1 is uh, at zero, this is one. This this when x1 is zero, this quantity is one, so this is zero. So at zero state. So it should be evident to you that uh, v zero comma zero is of course zero. All right. Now if I take any non-zero x one, right? So when else does this go to zero? This function. This function goes to zero next time at x one equal to pi, right? Because uh, cos will go from zero to uh, one, sorry, we'll go from one to zero to minus one. Um, wait a second, no, this will not go to so this will go to um, is next time it will go to zero is at two pi at x1 equal to two pi at x1 equal to two pi. This is zero. Uh, wait a second, at x1 equal to two pi, one minus cosine x1 is zero. Right. Um, right, 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 one zero. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So this is correct, right? So what I will sort of do is, um, let's see, what I will do is just to make my life sort of safe, uh, I am going to uh, sort of consider 
x1 in minus pi to pi and x2 in r right so in this sort of ball if you think of this as a ball or you can you can consider any uh, you know minus r to r yeah you can take any size in x2 x2 doesn't matter but if x1 is within minus pi to pi you are guaranteed that this is positive for all non zero x1 x2 therefore this function is positive definite um, in minus pi pi cross r so this is the cartesian product right so this is positive definite it's not radially unbounded notice it's not radially unbounded because the largest value this guy can take is 2 and this is not never going to infinity yeah so if i if because if i take x2 to be 0 and i propagate only along the x1 axis towards infinity this is the maximum value we will go to is 2 therefore this is not so this is an example of uh, not radially unbounded okay so great so now we do the analysis right we quickly take the derivative which is v dot is 1 minus cosine x1 gives sine x1 x1 dot plus x2 x2 dot and here i just plug in for x1 dot and for x2 dot right great so now i can see that uh, this guy this guy will cancel out right and i'm left with uh, minus sine x1 uh, i apologize this is x1 i believe minus sine x1 square minus x2 square which is again negative definite in minus pi pi cross r this is again not difficult to verify right because only at x1 equal to 0 so pi and minus pi are not included so only at x1 equal to 0 is this going to go to 0 right so this is of course uniformly asymptotically stable right because it's also decrescent right so so it's decrescent because decrescence is free because there is no time appearing here all right so excellent so this is an example where v is not readily unbounded therefore we don't have global stability so it is in fact possible right so it is in fact possible uh, so there is you know couple of more properties which i will probably look at uh, in the next lecture um, so because we won't have enough time now so what we have looked at today is the global stability property we worked out the earlier missing example of uh, stab uh, asymptotic stability which also turned out to be uniformly asymptotically stable and also turned out to be globally uniformly asymptotically stable we finally also looked at an example which was not uh, you know globally uniformly asymptotically stable right it was only it only had local uniform asymptotic stability and so we saw that this is also a possibility it's not that you are guaranteed to have global properties all the time especially for non-linear systems all right excellent so we will continue this discussion on stability next time uh, we will wrap up the lyapunov theorems and move forward all right that is the plan excellent all right i will see you again next time thank you mm -hmm.